turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I thought I was done with this passage of Scripture on Wednesday, but the Lord says, no, there's some more you need to, to cover here. So we're going to do that this morning. Um, I'm talking about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. And everything this morning is going to be in the Amplified Bible. So, are you ready? Um, here's here's the, where the, the title came from. You are built. You know, building something is a process. Right? Uh, wh whether, you, whether you're building a, a, a shed or, um, you know, a, a birdhouse or, or uh, whatever it is you're building, um, it's a process. And it, it takes planning and it takes... Um, resources, and so this is uh, God telling us that we, you and me, are his process. We, we are his building, and, and we uh, are what he is working on. I mean, he doesn't need to work on nations. He doesn't need to work on mountains. He doesn't need to work on uh, making a better mousetrap. I mean, all of those things can be done uh, through natural processes. But the supernatural process is this process of him making us into the image of Jesus. That's something we cannot do for ourselves. And, of course, man, through philosophies and, and religions, has tried for forever to, to improve the, the, the state of humanity. And, and every time they do, they seem to make it worse. But God is building us to be the way he wants us to be. So we are being built. We're going to talk about that a little bit. We are built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone. We've talked about that in several of our recent messages. Um, but you see, the chief cornerstone is, is kind of, that's the, the thing that holds it all together. So what we are being uh, built upon, the, the final result of, of God's work in our lives is, is so that we will be like Jesus Christ. Now, that sounds like a tall order. And to a lot of Christians, it's like, well, okay, when I get to heaven, I will be like him. But he's not talking about when we get to heaven. Of course, if you die and go to heaven, then, then you will not be sinning anymore because the, that, that body of sin will be dead and, and when he gives you a new body, when the, when the seventh trumpet blows and, and that, body, uh, that new body that he gives you come out of the grave, uh, you know, you're going to be transformed at that point. But see, he's, he's working on making us like him now. Okay, so in verse 21, it says, In him the whole structure is joined and welded together and, and uh, harmoniously, and it continues to grow and increase into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, consecrated, and sacred to the presence of the Lord. This is, there are several interesting things here in verse 21 when I looked into the Greek. And the Amplified kind of goes there, but... I, I was prompted to dig a little bit deeper. That, say, that where it says the whole structure. Well, he's not just talking about a shed or a birdhouse. Okay, the word structure here, oikodomio, it means a dwelling place that is domed over. You know, think about the, the U.S. Capitol building in Washington or the Texas State Capitol in Austin. The thing that makes those structures so... Uh, impressive is that dome that's on the top, right? Well, see, in ancient times, not everybody lived in a, uh, in a domed structure. That would have been a mansion. You know, most people, if they even had walls, you know, masonry walls, it was covered with, with wooden planks, and then they put grass or some kind of thatch up on the top. But a lot of people just lived in tents. But when he's saying... He's building a structure. 
it's not just he's building you a, a little shack off in the wilderness. No, he is building a domed dwelling for us. That okroidomio means to be domed over. Okay, and it says that we are joined together harmoniously. Well, that is, you know, we're down to the nitty gritty in, in Christian history. You know, they, they refer to this as the age of grace, you know, from the time that Jesus' resurrection until his second coming is often called the age of grace. Well, the, it, it says in Zechariah that there's a finishing capstone that is put on that dome structure, and it says when he does, there's grace, grace to it. Well, you know what the, the final act of God's grace is for the church of Jesus Christ right now? It's fitting us together. And that has not happened, really, for the last 2,000-something years. Oh, I mean, it has to a certain point. I mean, spiritually, I guess. When you go somewhere and you... Uh, encounter another Christian, your heart kind of recognizes there, you know, it takes one to know one. So it's kind of like your heart recognizes there's another believer in Jesus Christ there. But other than that, you know, once you get past that, like you start talking about the Bible, you know, they don't, this, they don't agree with you about this or that. So the last act of grace is fitting the Baptist and the Catholics and the Methodist and the Pentecostals all together. Right? That, that's that. What, and, and it says this is what he's doing. This is the project. This is not just the ecumenical council of the world, council of churches wants to do this. No. God wants to do this. And that is the work. And he's doing that work in the Baptists that are born again. He's doing that in the Catholics that are born again. He's doing that in you and me. He's doing that in uh, the, the assemblies of God. He's doing that for everybody that will let it be done. Now, of course, as I like to say, God loves freedom more than he loves control. He's not going to make you, if you are a square peg and you see there's a round hole over there, he's not going to take you by the nap of your neck and cram you into that hole and knock off your edges. You know, how that happens is, if you're a square peg and you need, need to go in that round hole, you just come around the body of Christ enough and those hard edges will get sanded off. Bobby Tomonic talked about this uh, Wednesday night about sandpaper Christians. Okay? That's how it happens. All right, keep going. Verse 22 says, In him and in fellowship with one another. That, that, that's in the brackets, but it's important because the, the word here is you are being built up into this structure with the rest. Well, that is actually a different word than the one that was used in verse 20 about you are being built. That's not oikodomio. This word here means being built up in the company of others. See, when you build something, uh, you usually have to have more than one material to build it with. I mean, even if you're just making a shack out of wood, you're going to need nails, uh, and, and you're, you might need caulking, and you know, you might need, um, you know, tar paper or something else. So you've got to have several different materials, and what God is working in the body of Christ, we talk about this Wednesday too, is we are all different materials. We, you know, our, our inner makeup, each one of, of us is unique in that. Everybody has a particular contribution to make to the body of Christ that is unique to you. Keep the place here in Ephesians and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Just to confirm that this is what God is doing. And, and we'll talk a little bit more as we go through today about how he does this. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul, speaking of himself and his fellow um, ministers, uh, Timothy and Apollo and Cephas and so forth, he says, For we are fellow workmen, joint promoters, laborers together, 
with and for God. For you are God's garden and vineyard and field under cultivation. You are God's building. According to the grace, the special endowment for my task that God has bestowed on me, like a skillful architect and a master builder, I laid the foundation, and now another man is building upon it. But let each one be careful how he builds upon it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. We talked in a message uh, last week, I guess it was, about how the word Christ means anointing. And, and anointing uh, means more than just, you know, getting a little dab of oil put on your head when you're sick and you need prayer. Uh, the, the anointing is the power to break the yoke, it says. Okay. Uh, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. But if anyone builds upon the foundation, whether it be with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, or straw, the work of each one will become plainly known and shown for what it is, for the day will declare it. The, the, the day, the end times. The, the, the day of the coming of the Lord, because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test and critically appraise the character and worth of the work each person has done. Now, this is interesting here in verse 13. This word work, it's nonspecific. This word is ergon, and, and you know we speak of ergonomics in something like how well does something function? You know we speak of, about a car having good ergonomics or or something like that. Okay, it simply means uh, what you do. Everything we do is under the watchful eye of God, and everything we do has consequences. And everything we do will have a result. And if what we are doing is not according to his plan and design, it says the day will burn it up. You know, so what we do, decisions that we make, uh, attitudes that we have, things that we say, what we are occupying our time and attention with, it's all going to get judged. Okay, now that doesn't have to be scary because it goes on to say here that it says if the work which any person has built on this foundation uh, survives the fire, uh, he will get his reward. But if the person's work is burned up under the test, he will suffer the loss of it, but he himself will be saved. Whew, glad to know that, but as one who has passed through the fire. Well, it says that the fire tests the character and worth of what we do. See, everything we do, every, all that we uh, expend our energy for, even if that was just getting in your car and coming here today, it, that, is, that is work in a sense. That is argon. You know, we're not talking about good works. We're not talking about, you know, uh, feeding the poor or handing out tracts or casting out demons or, or any of that. We're talking about just what you do has a certain character or worth to it. You know, I had to vacuum the house last night. Yeah, you have to do that every now and then. And I, I, I remember hearing something from a music teacher that explained how to make good progress with your practice. And, and you know, I've been, I've been playing the piano for a long time, but this was like something I didn't know. Th this, this music teacher was, was, was uh, asking his uh, grandmother, I guess it was, I don't remember, one of his relatives, well, how do, you, how do you stand cleaning house and not getting bored or not getting just bummed out by having to do it? And, sh and she said, well, I do it like, 
I love to do it, and it's the most important thing there is in life. And so, you know, I, I, I thought, you know what? I better adopt that mindset for vacuuming the house. And what God is telling us is if we would adopt a, a, a Jesus God mindset for everything we do, things would go a whole lot better. Not only that, but we'd be a lot happier. See, and so that's, that's the character and worth. That's what that Greek word actually means, number 3697. It actually means how excellent something is. See, I could vacuum the house excellently, or I could do a sloppy job of it. And you'll have to ask Ellen which one I did last night. But, <laughs> but anyway, okay, that's what the, and, and see, God is going to judge it. it it's going to be shown up. It, if you are sloppy in your uh, walking with the Lord, things are going to happen that are going to make you realize, hey, you know what, I wasn't as committed as I need to be. Just saying, and, and that's not saying you lose your salvation. He just told you right here, no, you're not going to lose your salvation. But you will wish uh, you had, uh, you know, uh, been more diligent about whatever that thing is. So, how do we... How do we do? Uh, how do we live our lives? I mean, you know, it, it, like the, the music teacher's grandmother said, well, well, do it like you love it. I know this sounds really, really trite and, and just like a, a cliche, but love is the key. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You might say, well, I don't like reading the Bible. Now, I do like reading the Bible. I love reading the Bible, but uh, there's, there's some things I don't love, actually. It might surprise you to know I don't love singing, but uh, I should sing. But when I sing with gusto, when I sing like, wow, this is what I really want to do, you know, like, like uh, you know, it's... You're standing at a football game singing the Star Spangled Banner or something. Well, then I love to sing. Okay, so it's like whatever it is that we are believing that God is leading us to do, love it. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 says, Now concerning things, uh, concerning food, actually, that has been offered to idols, of course we know that we all possess knowledge concerning these matters. Like, yeah, we know that there are some things that are of God and some things that are not of God and that we shouldn't mess with those things that are not of God. It says, but mere knowledge causes people to be puffed up, to bear themselves loftily and to be proud. But love, affection, goodwill, and benevolence edifies and builds up and encourages one to grow to his full stature. Well, there's that building up thing again. See, and what he's telling us here is there's nothing wrong with knowledge. In fact, we're going to look at that here in a minute. Knowledge is very, very important. But he says that if you have knowledge without love, it will make you puffed up. Well, this is interesting because in Strong's Concordance, the word puffed up, number 5448, has to do with growth. What do you think? Well, what's wrong with growth? Growth is a good thing. Well, not all growth is. If it, if it is by being inflated like a balloon, then it can pop. Okay? Or if it's growth just through natural processes. You take a piece of land and you don't mow it, or you don't uh, cultivate it, you don't plant anything there, uh, it's going to grow stuff. It's going to grow a lot of weeds. Okay, so that's what that word puffed up actually means, to grow by either if inflation or just by germination of natural processes. Well, let's talk about the natural processes. Keep the place here in 1 Corinthians, and let's go to 1 John chapter 2. What are the natural processes? 
The natural processes in our lives are kind of what we would fall back to or fall back upon if we're not walking in the Spirit. You know, somebody, somebody might ask, well, well, how come some Christians can do such awful things? Well, it's, it's easy. The answer to that is real simple. Because they're walking in the flesh and they're not walking in the spirit. Because what the flesh does, it tells you right here, there's three things that the flesh is hardwired to do. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 tells you, for do not love the world or the things that are in the world. Well, that's all the flesh knows how to do. You know, you say love to, the, to a, a, an unregenerate person, that's all they know that love means. Uh, for if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the craving for sensual gratification. You know, who doesn't want to be gratified, right? I mean, do you like to be irritated? Do you like to be punished? No, you want to be gratified. That's what the flesh does. That's just natural. The lust of the eyes, which the, the Amplified says, that's the greedy longings of the mind. Well, it could be more than, than just the mind. It's like you, you, you are trained that you need to have more, that more is better. You know, that, that progress means uh, more and more and more. Well, that's just natural. That's the way the natural works. You know, the natural does not like the idea of downsizing. That's why when so many people throughout the years have, have asked, you know, when they find out I, I'm a minister, they go, well, tell me about your church. How many people go to your church? It's like, that's just such a natural way of looking at something. And, and hey, even seminaries can train people in that natural uh, idea that, well, bigger is always better. No, bigger is not always better. But see, that's the natural, and that's that lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Um, these are from the, uh, the world. And, verse 17, and the world passes away. Well, that's that fire that will reveal what something is made of. The world passes away and disappears. And with it, the forbidden cravings and desires of it. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purposes in his life abides forever. Now, another thing about that puffed up, it has to do with being inflated. Now, a minute ago, I used the analogy of a balloon, but Scripture actually uses a different analogy. Leaven. Okay, yeast. You know, if, if you are making bread and you want it to be the nice, fluffy Mrs. Baird's kind, you have to use yeast to make it be like that. Otherwise, it'll be like, you know, cornbread. It'll be kind of hard and small, kind of like what we use for the, uh, the communion. That's unleavened. Bread, but leaven puffs up. And you think, well, I like Mrs. Baird's bread. What's wrong with Mrs. Baird's bread? Well, for natural things, you know, for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I guess it's okay. But it's not, it, that's not God's thing. God's things are unleavened. Let's talk about this. Go back to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Because being puffed up, Again, is just, the flesh likes to puff up. The flesh does not like to, uh, to uh, rid itself of, of things. It likes to, to be greater. It likes to aggrandize. It likes to, to become more powerful and, and bigger and, and stronger and so forth. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1. Here's an example of some Christians who were puffed up about something they should not have been puffed up about. It's actually reported among you that there's sexual immorality among you, impurity of a sort that's condemned and does not even um, occur among the heathen, for a man has his own father's wife. And you are proud and arrogant. 
Now, I thought about this, and I thought, well, what was the matter with these people? You know, didn't they know that, you know, that, that that's condemned in Leviticus, and, you know, that, that that's, uh, you know, that, that sexual immorality is one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not do that? Well, you know, this theology is still around today. It's like, we are not under the law. So you can commit, you can, you can commit adultery, you can steal, you can lie, you can cuss your parents out, you can, you can do all of this stuff, and that's okay because Jesus died for all of that. So he died, to, so you're, you, are, you are no longer under the law. What do you think about that? No, what it says in Hebrews is that God would write the law in your heart so that if you're walking in the Spirit, you won't even want to do any of those things. I'm not saying a Christian cannot do any of those things. Yeah, Christians can do those things, but it, they're still not right with God. And so for a Christian to be bragging and say, oh, we're so, we're so free from the law that we can even uh, have incestual adultery and and, and we're still happy with that. It's like Paul saying, no! He says, you ought rather to mourn and sorrow in shame uh, for the person who has done this shameful thing uh, until he is removed from, uh, from your midst. And then go to verse uh, 6. He says, about this in your church, your boasting is not good. Indeed, it's unseemly and entirely out of place. Do you not know that a little leaven will ferment the whole lump? See, that's that puffed up thing. And see, that happens when there's no love. Purge out the old leaven that you may be fresh dough uh, uncontaminated in Christ for he our Passover lamb has been sacrificed therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven nor with the leaven of vice and malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of purity nobility and honor and sincerity and unadulterated truth I've got some things to say some more today about truth. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. You know, if someone were to ask me, if they were going to ask me about Romans 8, if they, instead of asking, well, how many people come to your church? If they were to ask me, well, what is the, the most uh, beautiful? What is the most outstanding thing about your church? What makes your church a shiny City on the Hill, an example of what a church ought to be, I would say we love the truth. And we will not tolerate error once we know that it is erroneous. Right? I mean, can't you all say that honestly from the bottom of your heart? And there's a lot of things that a lot of the church world thinks is just hunky-dory that we know is erroneous and we're not going to have it here. Okay? And, and that's what I would say our, our claim to fame, if you want to call it that, would be, is we love the truth. And that is a very important thing because it says in 2 Thessalonians that those who end up believing the devil's lie and worshiping the Antichrist and taking the mark of the beast, he tells you why they do that. Because they did not receive the love of the truth. So I'd say if, that's, if that does indeed describe us, and I hope it does, I mean, I hope it describes me, I hope it describes all of us, then we better hold on to that because that is going to be vital, especially in the days that lie ahead. Anyway, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. <clears throat> 
It says, but if anyone <clears throat> teaches otherwise and does not consent to sound and wholesome messages of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching which is in agreement with godliness, he is puffed up. There's that word again. He is puffed up with pride and stupefied with conceit. You know, there's a lot of stupidity in our world today, but most everybody who is, is um, in that condition, that they're, they're happy with themselves being in that condition. <clears throat> and so it says, although they're willfully ignorant, and they have a mon morbid fondness for controversy and disputes and strife about words. Can you say politics? Which, uh, which result in envy and jealousy and quarrels and contention, uh, abuse and insults and slander and base suspicions and protracted wrangling and wearing discussion and perpetual friction among men who are corrupt in the mind and bereft of the truth, who imagine that godliness or righteousness is a source of profit, a money-making business, a means of livelihood from such withdrawal. You know, if somebody else asked me, if, if they really pressed me, if I said, you know, the thing I love about Romans 8 Church is we love the truth, if they, um, if they were really to press me on it, well, what do you mean? You know, they, you know, everybody loves the truth. Nobody likes deception. I said, Romans 8 is not following the prosperity gospel where we think that, that God's biggest plan for all of us is for us to have our best life right now. We do not preach that. We do not practice. Does anybody here in this room believe that? Now, that's not, I mean, God does say, I want you to prosper and I want you to be healthy, but there's a condition. What is that condition? As your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, your inner man prospers. He doesn't want your outer man prospering and being healthy if your inner man is full of what he talked about here, about envy and jealousy and greed and wrangling. He doesn't want you prospering if you're in that condition. In fact, he would be doing you a favor if he knocked it all out from under you. Really. And it says, indeed, verse 6, indeed, uh, um, godliness is the subject there, is a source of immense profit. For godliness accompanied with contentment, that contentment which is a sense of inward sufficiency, is great and abundant gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and obviously we cannot take anything out of it. You know, even when Elijah was caught away by the, the chariot of fire, his clothes didn't even go with him. Right? They fell to the ground and, and Elisha picked it up and said, oh, okay, this must have some anointing. And so he went back to the river and the river parted. But Elijah didn't even take that with him when he left. But those who crave to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish, useless, and godless and hurtful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction, and miserable perishing. Go back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> you know, we, we've, uh, back there in 1 Corinthians 8, we contrasted um, being puffed up with having love. Well, this is not just a, a hypothetical, theoretical, philosophical idea. That this is something which God is wanting to work into our life, into our being, so that that, that becomes so love becomes something that we do, something that, that uh, energizes all of our efforts, all of our desires. First Corinthians 13 verse two, he, he delineates this real clearly here. He says, "If I have prophetic power." that is, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, and understand the secret truths and mysteries. 
and possess all knowledge. Well, it sounds like we're talking about a spirit-filled Christian here, aren't we? And if I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains. So we're not just talking about a spiritual, a spirit-filled Christian. We're talking about a, uh, a, a well-practiced spiritual, spirit-filled Christian. But if, if I have all of that and have not love, I am nothing and a useless nobody. Verse 4, love endures long. Okay, this is where the rubber meets the road. This, this is where the sandpaper starts rubbing our rough edges. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love is never envious nor boils over with jealousy. It's not boastful or vainglorious. It does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited arrogant or inflated with pride. There's that puffed up thing, right? <clears throat> it is not rude or unmannerly and does not act unbecomingly. Love does not insist on its own right or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful, and it takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Well, Ray, I don't know anybody like that. Well, you know what? I don't either. <laughs> I don't accept Jesus. Well, so then how are we supposed to do that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Go back to 1 Timothy. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. <clears throat> See, we're, we're seeing clearly this is God's intention and this is what his work in us will accomplish. And, we, and we've got a word for it. It's love. It's God's love. The word there in Greek is agape. That's different than uh, than romantic love. That's even different than familial love or brotherly love. That, that is a God kind of love. And okay, I think most Christians kind of have that in their theology, but, but it's hard to work that into our lives. Well, how that gets worked into our lives is right here. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. It says, the object and purpose of our instruction. In other words, this is why you're here today. This is why I'm standing here spouting what I'm spouting today. This is the purpose of all of this. The purpose is not to make me look good. The purpose is not for you to, to put another notch on your belt that you went to church on August the 23rd, 2020. There's a purpose. And that purpose is three things. Love, which springs from a pure heart and a good conscience. When you have a good conscience, it's like, okay, you know, it says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation. But there's a key to that. There's, there's a condition. What is that condition? Walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Okay, so, so that condition number one is God is teaching us love from a pure heart, not put on love. A lot of people can put on, oh, I love you so much, and then they're backstabbing you after you go out the door. No, we're talking about real love and how to, how to put the flesh down and walk in the Spirit. You know, that flesh, and the Holy Spirit says, are you going to act that way? <laughs> no, Lord, I'm not. And so, Lord, just show me how to do this. That, that happened Friday night to me. Well, actually, it's Friday afternoon. I came up here Friday afternoon to get things set up for Friday ministry, and they were setting up for a party out there. Oh, they had, in a construction, they had all of their people, all of their workers and their families, and they had music playing, and the kids were throwing frisbees and having a great time, and they had coolers uh, lined up on both sides of the walkway coming in here. I said, oh, God, <clears throat> what are they going to do? <clears throat> and it was almost like in the flesh I was... I was almost tempted to go, go find Bobby Wood somewhere and say, we can't do this. 
or, or I was tempted to call all y'all and just call Friday night off. And, <clears throat> and God said, uh-uh. <clears throat> Bobby Wood and the Enoch people, they're our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if they're going to party, maybe their party and our party will become one big party. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, cool. So we had one big party Friday night, didn't we? And we all had a good time, and we even had some food after we got done. But see, that was an example of where I had a choice where I could either you know, look at things in the flesh or ask God to correct my vision so I was looking at it in the spirit. Right? Okay, so that's uh, love, which springs from a pure heart. A good conscience, which means you're walking in the spirit and not after the flesh. <clears throat> and sincere, unfeigned faith. Um, you don't let this place in 1 Timothy go, but go back to 1 John. First John chapter 4 <clears throat> tells us something very important. And it's real concise and to the point. First John chapter 4 verse 19. It says, we love God because he first loved us. That's how this works. You know, sometimes pride will keep a person from being receptive to God and will keep people from being receptive to the good things that God has for us. <clears throat> and maybe an awareness of his love, pride can keep us from um, receiving that. And when that happens, when you uh, fail to receive or refuse to receive God's love, inevitably you are going to end up in fear. Because if you're not depending on God, then you're dependent on yourself and you're going to come to the end of yourself and you're going you're to, oh God, what do I do? Well, the problem was, he had something for you that you could receive so you don't end up in that state. But praise God, even if we do end up in that state, he'll still meet us there. Verse 16 says, And we know and understand and recognize and are conscious of <clears throat> by observation and by experience. And we believe the love that God cherishes for us. <clears throat> God is love. And he who dwells and continues in love dwells and continues in God. And God dwells and continues in him. And in this union and communion with him, love is brought to completion and attains perfection with us. You notice it's a process, not just a one-time deal. <clears throat> it attains perfection with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Everything that we are focused on here has to do with being ready for the day of judgment and that we see that coming. Again, another thing, if people were to press me and say, well, what do you think is so great about your church? I mean, look at you. You're just a well, 15 or 20 people. How, how can that be a good church? And I say, we are getting ready for the day of the Lord. That, that is such an important part of our focus that that almost eclipses anything else. <clears throat> and, and this says that, that by, by being aware of God's love for you, it will get you ready for that day. In this union and communion, love is brought to completion and perfection <clears throat> that we may have confidence for the day of judgment and boldness to face him and to face the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Okay, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to touch on a couple of things here before we finish today. Go back to that first verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> it says, knowledge puffs up, 
But love edifies, builds up, encourages one to grow to his full stature. Well, how, okay, we know it's by God's love, but what is the method that God uses to, to impart his love to us and to, to teach us to be the way he wants us to be when our flesh is going a different direction? Well, this is the way I would describe it, okay? This is thus saith the ray, okay? But I do believe this is accurate. He does it by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the, uh, the method or the agency by which God transforms us. And it describes that the things that the Holy Spirit brings to us, it refers to them as gifts, spiritual gifts. Actually, in the, the Greek, it only refers to them as spiritual. That word gifts is actually not used there. It's spiritual things. He brings things of the Spirit to us. That means you're not going to get it through the natural. You're not going to get it from the TV. You're not going to get it from your upbringing. You're not going to get it from your education. You're not going to get it from the Internet. You're going to get it from the Holy Spirit, or you're not going to get it. And he describes that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And this gives just a couple of examples of spiritual things, spiritual gifts, if you will. Verse 4 says that he who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies and improves himself. Now, I was talking about Friday and how I had such a shock when I drove up here to get ready for Friday ministry and I saw there was this, this big party going on outside. All the way up here, this is interesting, there's a connection here. All the way on the drive up here, I was, I was prompted, just out of the blue, I was prompted to pray in the Spirit. So I was just driving along, praying in tongues, and I didn't know what I was praying for until I got here, and I realized, hey, I'm praying for myself. <clears throat> That's why it says that he who, who speaks in an unknown tongue edifies and improves himself. But he who prophesies and interprets the divine will and purpose, that's what I'm doing right now, right? I'm prophesying, okay? So he who does that edifies and improves the church. I hope you're getting some kind of edification out of this. I really do, okay? He improves and edifies and promotes growth in Christian wisdom, piety, holiness, and happiness. And then, of course, in Jude, Right before Revelation, <clears throat> it says this about the Holy Spirit, about praying in the Spirit. And the implication that, well, you're edifying yourself doesn't mean that nobody else is going to get any benefit from it. Uh, I remember the testimony that Irene gave about that Owen... Uh, was about to fall off a girder in a building, many, many stories above the ground, and that miraculously he, he was able to grab hold of the thing and pull himself back up on the girder. And when he got home and was telling Irene about that, she was saying, well, what time did that happen? And, and he told her, and she said, well, right at that time, God had me praying in the Spirit for you, and I didn't know what was going on. So praying in the Spirit is not just for yourself. It can be for others too. So here in Jude chapter 20 when it says, but you beloved, build yourself up on your holy faith, praying in the spirit. <clears throat> he goes on to, to, to connect some other things with that. He says, guard and keep yourself in the love of God and patiently wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, praying in the spirit will help you do that. And refute so as to convict those who dispute with you. Praying in the Spirit will teach you how to do that. Because if you just knee-jerk reaction, somebody tells you something and you know that's wrong. You say, well, that's wrong. Blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> well, maybe you better let the Holy Spirit give you the answer to what, how to refute what they're saying. 
and on some have mercy who waver in doubt. See, this is all part of the Holy Spirit teaching us how we are to function in the Spirit. Strive to save others, snatching them out of the fire, <clears throat> and on others take pity, but with loathing even the garments spotted by the flesh and polluted by their sensuality. Okay. Go to Philippians chapter 1. I could give you examples in, in the life of Jesus where because he is love, his love revealed things to him that were helpful for the person that he was ministering to. One was he went into the house of, of a Pharisee. He, the Pharisee invited him to dinner, and um, <clears throat> so he went. <clears throat> and the Lord Jesus recognized that um, the Pharisee had prejudice. And so the, he took the guy aside and, and talked to him about that. Oh, the rich young ruler came to him and, and he said, well, what must I do to have eternal life? And basically it got down to this. Jesus said, well, hey, you love your money too much. Get rid of all your money and follow me. And that's, that's the way you'll, you'll get there. And he didn't want to do it. But it says that when Jesus said that, he looked at him and he loved him. See, if we're going to tell anybody how the cow we have ate the cabbage, number one, we better love that person first. And secondly, we better have spiritual discernment. We better have that spiritual gift before we start telling other people what's wrong with them. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more and extend to the fullest development in knowledge and in keen insight, and that your love may display itself in greater depth of acquaintance and more comprehensive discernment. You know, sometimes it's easy for us to see something is not of God. You know, I, I could make a political statement here and I'm, I'm going to restrain myself from doing that. But we can see a lot of things going on in the political realm. Oh, that's not right. But sometimes you have to look a little deeper and you will get some more discernment if even better than what you already thought you knew. And it says, so that you may surely learn to sense what is vital and a proven prize, what is excellent and of real value, recognizing the highest and the best. There is a, a striving for excellence in spiritual things that God wants us to be involved in. And look, it's not a pride thing. It's not a competition thing. It's not, well, well, we're better than First Church of something or other over here. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is just like what Owen Cain said to me in, in the fall of, or in the spring of 1978. What he said was, whatever you know about God, there's more. We've got to be teachable. That's what we're talking about here. So that we may surely prize what is excellent and of real value and recognizing the highest and best. What I'm saying is, don't be satisfied with, what, with the theology you currently have. I'm not saying there's necessarily anything wrong with the theology that you currently have, but if you're just willing to just sit there with that, you are not prizing what's excellent and seeking the highest and best. You're you might be accepting something that is too low. You need to be striving for, for more understanding, more revelation, more insight, more Holy Spirit discernment. We need to do that because it's a process. None of us have arrived. And, and, and any minister that you listen to and you think, well, he's arrived. I need to just follow him. No, you need to go past him. Okay? So that 
you may be untainted and pure and unerring and blameless so that with hearts sincere and certain and unsullied you may approach the day of Christ not stumbling, I don't want to do that, or causing others to stumble. I don't want to do that either. And may you abound and be filled with the fruits of righteousness, of right standing with God and doing right, which comes through Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, to the honor and praise of God, that his glory may be both manifested and recognized. I think that says it all. So, Father, do this. We submit ourselves to you to do that. And, Father, I thank you that we know that this is your work, that this is your intention, as you say in Ephesians 4, the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints, and that you do this with with full and accurate knowledge that your Holy Spirit alone can give us. And so, Father, we, we depend on you. We look to you for that. And I thank you, Father, that you have begun a good work in us and that you will complete that work right up until the day of Jesus' return. And that all you 